Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and we've got another Ryzen laptop to take a look at. This one from HP. This is their new NVX360 and it's powered by one of the new Ryzen 4500U processors. This is the smallest of the new Ryzen's I have looked at so far. Very attractive and lightweight package. And this is a two-in-one, so you can put it into tablet mode here, uh, have it work in tent mode, or of course you can just have the display uh, seated like this for watching movies and that sort of thing. And we're going to be taking a closer look at this laptop and what it's all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is on loan from HP. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All of the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor is anyone reviewing or approving what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop is all about. Now the price point on this one is $799 as configured. Uh, it starts at $699 with a Ryzen 3 configuration. And if you want to go fully decked out, you can spend about $1,400 bucks for an 8-core Ryzen 7 version. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. Our review unit has an AMD Ryzen 5 4500U processor inside. That is a six-core chip. It's got eight gigabytes of RAM, which is DDR4 in dual-channel configuration, but the RAM is not upgradable. Uh, this one has a 256 gigabyte NVMe SSD. You can upgrade the storage on it at least, uh, but again, not the RAM. All configurations of this laptop include a 1080p 13.3 inch touch display. It works very nicely. It looks great. It's actually one of the brighter displays I've seen on some of these newer uh, Ryzen laptops, which is good to see here. And I really like the overall industrial design of this. It's all metal and it's not very big. It's kind of in the smaller footprint versus some of the 13 inch laptops you might be accustomed to. So it's really thin and light. Uh, very attractive, especially compared to the prior generation of this. They were able to strip off a lot of the bezels here and make the package smaller overall with the same screen size. And I think they've done a really nice job with this. It's a very attractive looking machine, both in appearance and just in how it feels. Now, the weight on this one is just under three pounds or uh, 1.3 kilograms. I always like to remind people that the thinner and lighter something gets, the more it will cost. So you can get Ryzen machines with the same processor for less money, but those are gonna be a little bit bigger and heavier. So if you want something thin and light like this, there will be a price premium, but it might be worth it if you don't wanna lug around something that is heavier than uh, what this one weighs. Let's take a look at the ports now. We've got a headphone microphone jack right here. Uh, next to it is a rather unique USB 3 port. This is just a standard USB-A connector, but it's got a little door on here. And I found the best way to use it is just to take out your cable here and just kind of nudge it in from the side to push the door down and then uh, connect up the cable. Uh, I've never seen a door on a USB port before, but this one's got it. Uh, next to it is a USB-C port. Uh, this is a full service USB-C port, so you can use it for display output along with power in, uh, and it will support data devices as well. So you could use a docking station or something like that with that USB-C port. Uh, just note though that this is not a Thunderbolt port, uh, but it is a Gen 2 USB-C port that can run at a max of 10 gigabits per second. On the other side of the laptop, we've got a, a, a micro SD card slot here. You got another one of those USB 3 ports with a door, and you have a power connector. So the power connector that comes with the laptop is using that circular barrel connector and not the USB-C. So when you do have it plugged in, you're not tying up the port if you don't uh, want to. So I thought that was nice that you have the flexibility of power in over here or through the power adapter that's on the side of the laptop. And it's got a very nice trackpad. It's got plenty of real estate here. Uh, one thing that I did note is that it's very sensitive when you tap on it. So I did disable tap to click. Uh, this is a click pad though, so I get my clicks when I actually push it down. Uh, but that was my only complaint with it, and overall, a uh, very nice input mechanism there. Uh, nice keyboard too, good size keys, nicely spaced. They made very efficient use of the casing here. Uh, it's also backlit, uh, so that's good. And you got a couple of other things of note on here. You do have a fingerprint reader for getting in with Windows Hello, so that's good. Your power switch is here. And there's some other stuff that I thought was kind of neat. The first thing is that it's got a camera shutter for the webcam. 
So when you push down this key, it'll activate uh, the webcam's shutter. So you can see when you push it down, it will put a physical shutter in front of the camera lens, and you'll know it's on because your camera lens goes all white on you there. Uh, and then when you want to turn it off, of course, you just depress the key, and that key will light up because the camera will still work. It'll just be obstructed. So the key will be lit when you have the camera obstructed, and then when you click it again, it will come off and that light will turn off there as well. Uh, next to it is another feature that was kind of unique to this one in that you can control the fan speed uh, with this key here. So when you push the key, uh, what you're going to get is the thermal profile settings. And you can see right now I've got mine set to performance. Uh, they have four different settings. So you have the performance one, which we're on now, which gives you the best performance, but the most amount of fan noise. Uh, HP recommended is a little less performance, but a little less fan noise as well. It's kind of the midpoint. Uh, comfort is kind of an odd one because what it does is keeps the temperature of the laptop down, which means it brings the performance of the laptop down, but it also runs the fan a little bit more to keep things cool. And then the quiet mode uh, will give you minimal performance, but also no fan noise. The fan will still run very, very quietly, but you really can't hear it. Uh, so if you're just doing some web browsing or some word processing or something low key and you don't want to hear the fan noise in a quiet room, you can switch it to quiet and that will turn the fan pretty much down to its lowest possible level, barely even audible, and you can use the computer in silence. But if you want to boot up a game or something, you can switch it over to performance and get the better performance out of the machine that this chip can deliver. Uh, fan noise overall is about what you would expect for a compact laptop. It can get a little bit loud, uh, so it's nice to have this control at the ready. So if you're really bothered by the fan noise when you're trying to concentrate on work, uh, you can switch it into quiet mode. But if you don't uh, care about that and need the performance, you can easily switch it back. And I thought it was kind of neat that they mapped that control to the keyboard and made it a very important feature that you can get at easily. So that was unique there. Uh, there's also a microphone mute button here as well, so you can mute the mic uh, just like you can shutter the camera with a key press. Now there is pen support on this one, but we did not get a pen in the box with it. However, HP says it supports the Microsoft Pen Protocol 2.0, uh, which supports some additional options for drawing on screen. Now these new Ryzen chips get great battery life, and this laptop is no exception to that rule. Uh, in our testing with the display brightness up pretty high, we were getting about eight hours-ish of basic tasks done on the laptop, basic web browsing, word processing, that sort of thing. Uh, if you start doing photo editing and video editing and things that uh, impact the processor more significantly, you'll see less battery life, of course. Uh, HP is rating the battery at about 12 hours for basic tasks, provided you have the display brightness turned down. And I would agree with them on that battery life estimate, uh, again, provided you've got the display at a lower level. The display usually is one of the biggest eaters of battery life. Uh, so if you get that display brightness down and you're going for a long haul or something, I think you can uh, definitely get close to their estimates. It does charge pretty quickly. It does support fast charging. Uh, so I think you should be able to get the uh, juice back in the tank pretty quick on it. Uh, and overall, it's a good battery performer that I think will get most people through a workday. So let's take a look now at performance and we'll load up uh, Google Chrome here and take a look at the nasa.gov homepage and see how that all comes together. As you can see, things render up here very quickly. Uh, we're just connected to my home Wi-Fi. I have AC Wi-Fi in my house, but the Wi-Fi radio inside supports the new Wi-Fi 6 standard as well. And as you can see here, web browsing is uh, working pretty nice on here and is very snappy. Let's take a look now at some YouTube videos. So here we've got a 1080p 60 video running from my YouTube channel. Uh, it did drop a few frames initially when I first started playing the video, and then when I made it full screen, it dropped a few more. Uh, but now that the video is playing back here at full screen, no problems, and we haven't had any additional drop frames. So I think you'll have a, a good outcome here playing back YouTube videos, even those that are running at 60 frames per second, along with Netflix and the other video services as well. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test with the full performance settings enabled, we got a score of 178.4 on version 1.0 of that test and 101 on version 2.0. That puts it very close to the Lenovo IdeaPad Flex 5 that has the same processor. 
Uh, so probably within the margin of error there. And you can also see that all of these Ryzen chips are very competitive against some of the Intel machines out there, namely the new 10th generation i5 chips. But where these AMD devices do better is in graphics. And we're going to load up some games now. And I think you'll be pretty impressed with the performance that we're able to get out of one of these new AMD processors. Let's kick things off with Grand Theft Auto 5. So here is GTA 5 running on the uh, laptop here. And we are at 1080p lowest settings. And as you can see, our frame rate is in the 50s. It'll occasionally jump into the 40s, as you can see here. Uh, sometimes we'll see a little bit of a hit when it reads off the disk. I have a USB drive powering this right now. Uh, but overall, it's been great and on par with other uh, Ryzen-based machines that we have looked at recently with this new generation. These chips are exceptionally powerful for the price point. And what we're seeing here is performance that we would typically get out of one of those MX150 GPUs from just a couple of years ago. Yet we've got everything in a really thin and light package here. So GTA 5 uh, is running great on this device and you'll probably get even better frame rates at a 720p resolution. So next up is Rocket League and we're running it at 1080p with all of the settings turned up. And as you can see here, we're getting about 30 frames per second at those settings. A little bit of a dip there to 20, but by and large, it is holding its own uh, at the maximum. Now, of course, if we were to turn the settings down, we could get a better frame rate at this resolution, or we could go down to 720p and adjust the settings up again. Again, it's up to you to figure out the best balance of visual quality and frame rate. But overall, this is spectacular for a computer that lacks that discrete GPU. Let's take a look at a few more things. So here is Doom 2016. We're running in Vulcan mode, 1080p lowest settings. And as you can see, we're getting about 30 frames per second, sometimes 40 frames per second. Uh, if we were to turn it down to 720p, we would get into the 60 frames per second territory. Uh, but again, another you know, recent title that is running exceptionally well on a computer without a discrete GPU. All right, next up is No Man's Sky, 1080p lowest settings. We're getting about 30 to 35 frames per second or so when we're in the spaceship. Uh, and then when we go down to the surface of the planet, we're in probably around the 20 frames per second territory, give or take. Uh, this is one game that would do better at 720p. And I think there are a lot of AAA titles that will also uh, perform better on this chipset at around that resolution as well, most of the time with low settings. But nonetheless, this is something that you really couldn't do very well on one of these small laptops in the past. And now uh, you can do that uh, without having to spend a lot on a gaming laptop. So it's a great little gaming device if you're looking to play games casually. Of course, you'll probably want to go with a gaming laptop uh, to get better performance with its own GPU. But again, I think you know this is fantastic for uh, what you're getting here and it's really remarkable to see how far along uh, these processors have come since I started reviewing PCs about six years ago. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test we got a score of 964 with the laptop here set in its performance mode. That puts it right on par with the Lenovo that we looked at a few weeks ago and even the uh, Acer Swift 3 which was running with the 8-core variant of this AMD processor. Again, you'll be hearing the fan really going on this thing when you're running games like this, and that's what that performance mode is there for, but you can also turn it down with that uh, utility we looked at a little bit earlier when you're not playing games to get quieter operations going. I also ran this benchmark on each of the different uh, performance settings just so you can get a feel for what that does to the overall system performance. And if we pull up that slide now, uh, you'll see of course that we get 964 in that performance mode. Uh, the recommended mode is pretty close, uh, 957. It's a little bit slower on the CPU side, but pretty close to what we got on the performance mode. Comfort, of course, will take a dip in performance both on the CPU and the GPU. And then, of course, Quiet will run at the least amount of performance. So going from the performance mode to the Quiet mode is a substantial uh, step down in performance for games. But I do think when you're uh, running basic web browsing and word processing and that sort of thing, uh, the Quiet mode, if that's important to you, really won't impact your day-to-day -day work all that much. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a score of 98.3%. That is a passing grade, and you can see also the temperature that the processor was registering when it was at the end of that test. 
Uh, one thing to note is that we ran that test in performance mode, which means that when you are set to that mode, you shouldn't see all that much variation in performance, especially when you're playing games. And that uh, was something we experienced when we were playing the games we were testing just a few minutes ago. So pretty consistent across the board. Uh, but note, if you go into comfort mode or quiet mode, that's where you're going to see the thermal throttling because it will be adjusting the processor performance based on how much heat it is detecting. And that'll be very, very evident in the quiet mode. So again, quiet mode is going to be good for the basics. But if you start doing things that are more demanding on the processor, you will see in quiet mode a pretty big variation in performance from one minute to the next. So switch it into performance mode. Those fans will kick on, but you'll have very consistent performance when you're stressing the processor. Now the fan intake is on the bottom here, so you're going to want to keep the laptop off of carpet and fabric and things that would clog up those vents. Uh, the rubber feet here will keep it elevated enough to get airflow in uh, to cool down that processor. Uh, the speakers are also here on the bottom. They're on the left and right hand side here. Uh, they are downward firing, so they will vary in their sound quality depending on what they're placed down upon. I found the speakers to be okay. They are Bang & Olufsen branded, but there's not a lot of bass to them, but there's good stereo separation. However, if you want better audio quality, I would plug in a pair of headphones or use some Bluetooth headphones here on the laptop. Let's take a look now and see if it runs Linux, and then we'll wrap things up. All right, so we've got Ubuntu 20.04 loaded up here. As you can see, the touch display is working. Video is being detected properly. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, audio, all good on here. The one thing that isn't good is the brightness setting here. I can't get the brightness to change on the display, even though it thinks it's doing it. So that's one area that I'll have to spend a little bit more time tinkering with. Uh, but beyond that, it looks like it's running Linux as well as some of the other recent 4000 series Ryzen chips we have looked at. So altogether, I think it's a very nice laptop. I think it's pretty reasonably priced for what it is. The performance is great. I really just like the overall look and feel of it. And it just feels like a nice premium Ryzen experience. And it's nice to see these chips getting some love in some higher end looking hardware here. So all in, I continue to be very excited about the direction that AMD has taken with these new chips. And we're seeing just remarkable performance out of all of these new computers. And I'm sure we'll be seeing more of these as the year progresses here. So stay tuned for that. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Tom Albrecht, Chris Allegretta, David Hockman, Brian Parker, Mike Patterson, and Bill Pomerantz. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.